Your Excellencies, the Ambassadors and High Commissioners, distinguished guests, dear trustees, dear friends. It is a great pleasure to welcome you today to the Cyprus Institute's 2018 Hubert Curien Memorial Lecture. This year, we have the great honor to welcome a distinguished economist as a speaker, Dr. Janes Podolski, former EU Commissioner for the Environment and Trustee of the Cyprus Institute. I would like now to call to the podium the Chairman of the BOT, Board of Trustees of the Cyprus Institute, Professor Danolov Riska, for a short address. Thank you very much. Dear uh, distinguished guests, friends, colleagues, we have, as usual, a great show for you tonight. You can see a very enigmatic title up on the board. We're all eager to start with it. And so I have now the honor to call, call on Ms. Andrula Vasiliou, former European Commissioner for Health and Education, Culture, Multilingualism, and Youth, and trustee of the Cyprus Institute, to introduce our speaker. Mrs. Vasiliou. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. As you know, the Hubert Curian Memorial Lectures were founded by the Cyprus Institute in honor of the late Professor Hubert Curian. Hubert Curian was one of the most prominent scientists and science policy makers of the 20th century. It was therefore a great honor for our institute that he was one of its trustees and founding chair of its International Council, and his contribution in the planning and realization of the Cyprus Institute was pivotal and profound. It was therefore the least that the Institute could do to honor his memory. Each and every year since 2006, an important and distinguished international personality is invited to deliver the Hubert Curien Memorial Lecture. It is therefore a particular honor for the Institute that Dr. Janes Podoshnik has accepted our invitation to deliver this year's lecture. For me in particular, it is also a great pleasure to welcome Janes Podoshnik and make the introductions. In addition to being a very distinguished speaker, as you will soon find out, he is a dear friend of both my husband and myself, and we were both very happy indeed when Janes accepted the invitation of the Cyprus Institute to join us in the Board of Trustees of the Institute as from last year. Dr. Janes Podoshnik is a Slovenian national. He got his bachelor's degree, his master's degree, and his PhD in economics from the University of Ljubljana. After a successful career as a senior researcher at the Institute for Economic Research in Ljubljana, in 1994, he was appointed director of the Institute of Microeconomic Analysis and Development of the Republic of Slovenia. In 2001, he was appointed minister councillor at the Slovenian prime minister's cabinet, and in 2002, he was appointed minister for European affairs. He also headed the negotiating team for the accession of Slovenia to the European Union. This was the occasion for the close collaboration of Dr. Podoshnik and Dr. George Vasiliu. This was also the occasion for me to meet and to get to know Janes Podoshnik at first. After the accession of the 10 new member countries to the EU, the so-called Big Bang in 2004, Yanis was nominated by his country and approved by President Barroso and the European Parliament to become Slovenian's first commissioner, responsible for research and science. As a matter of fact, he is the father of CRG, uh, C, uh, GRC. GRC, and I know that many of you here are uh, beneficiaries of GRC. When I, uh, and then, then in uh, 2000, so when I joined the European Commission in 2008, 
Yanis was one of the few commissioners I knew and became friends with. In 2010, under Barroso II Commission, Yanis Potosnik took up the second mandate responsible this time for environment, succeeding the Greek commissioner Stavros Dimas. His mandate, as indeed mine, came to an end in November 2014. During his term of office, he gained the respect of everyone as a very competent, serious, hardworking, and devoted commissioner. And at the same time, he was liked by his colleagues and all the people who worked with him as a kind, humble, and collegial person. In 2014, Dr. Podoshnik was appointed for a three-year term as a member and co-chair of International Resource Panel hosted by the United Nations Environment Program. In the same year, he was also appointed as a chairman of the Forum for the Future of Agriculture, the most authoritative scientific forum for scientists and experts working in the area of natural resource management. He leads scientific experts as they help countries use natural resources sustainable, sustainably without compromising economic growth and human development. Dr. Potoshnik is also a partner in Systemic, which was launched in 2016. Science has shown that our current system for food, energy, industry, transported cities are inefficient and largely unsustainable. The UN Global Goals and the Paris Agreement have set the targets we must reach to protect the Earth and make sure everyone in the growing global population has a chance to prosper. Systemic is hoping to accelerate these urgent transformations. Dr. Podoshnik was awarded the honorary degree of Doctor of Science by London Imperial College. He also received an honorary degree from Ghent University of Belgium. And in September 2013, he received the UN's 2013 Champions of the Earth Award. Dr. Podoshnik will speak to us tonight on a very interesting topic, as you will see, economy transition and the role of the circular economy. Today, we are more interconnected and interdependent than ever. We are called upon to face many serious challenges which no country can face alone. We can only address them together. Agreement on sustainable development goals is the first important step in the direction required. The current economic model is not sustainable, and it is essential and urgent that we transform it. Circular economy is an instrument which could help transforming the economy model to a more sustainable one. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure we are all looking forward to hear more on the topic from Dr. Podoshnik himself. So I call Dr. Podoshnik to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Andrula. This was very kind and very touchy. Uh, dear friends, I promise you two things. This will be quite a long lecture, but it will not be a boring one. So I will talk about the economy transition and the role of the circular economy. And before actually starting to go more into the substance, maybe just a few words about uh, the co-chairing of International Resource Panel from UN. We have a scientific panel where we have approximately 40 internationally recognized experts from all over the world. And we are kind of a sister organization of the IPPC, International Panel for Climate Change. Only we are less known. Why? Because climate change was more seriously on the political agenda than resource management was ever on the political agenda. But believe me, it is coming quickly and it will become extremely important. We have also the steering committee, approximately 35 member states uh, from all over the world. Then we have a 
Secretariat, which is located in Paris. And our role is actually science policy interface, where relates to the resource management. We have till now published over 20 reports, if I'm precise, 25 reports. And uh, our work uh, is continuing, and uh, the real essence of our direction in which we are working is how really start to connect policy making better with the science, because in the past we were relatively strong in scientific, uh, in the scientific uh, deliveries, while we were relatively weak in how to translate that to the policy world. The things on which I would like before starting really to talk, to draw your attention, are uh, this, and this is basically the base of the environmental scientific approach. In many cases, we focus on the climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, plastic problems, soil degradation. All those are very serious, in many ways, neglected problems caused by human activities. We must deal with the impacts and states of the problems we are already facing, but more important is to identify the drivers and pressures causing them and address them with appropriate measures. This uh, DPSIR framework, as we call it, is a framework in which too much political attention goes to the state and impact and too few to the driving forces and pressures, which means that our responses are to a large extent connected to this, instead they would be connected to this. If I give you just one example, uh, migrations today in Europe. We are fighting migrations because migrations and security are typical impact and state. We are fighting them by putting more police on our streets, building higher walls around Europe. Instead, would, we would actually create a program, if I paraphrase the President of the United States who said uh, US uh, first, we would need to create a program Africa first because Africa is the fastest growing continent, they are our neighbors, and if we don't understand that they will actually, that we are just facing the, the wave, but tsunami is ahead of us of migration, then we are really blind. But let me go to the structure of the lecture which I want to share with you. First, first the world we live in and the challenges we are facing, then just quickly on sustainable development goals and the role of sustainable consumption and production, economic model driving our lives, resource management, recent IRP reports, the role of circular economy, trends related to circular economy which are worth exploiting, and finally, leadership and governance. Of course, at the end, I will also make a kind of wrap-up of everything. But let us start with the world in which we are living and the challenges we are facing. Whenever you will see on the left hand, hand side corner International Resource Panel and here UN Environment, these are the data which are based on the research work which was done by the International Research Panel. So, 20th century we could easily call the century of the Great Acceleration. The growth of population was by a factor of 3.7, annual extraction of construction materials grew by a factor of 34, ores and minerals by a factor of 27, fossil fuels by a factor of 12, and biomass was growing by the same factor as the human population. Average total material extraction grew by a factor of eight, and greenhouse gas emissions grew by a factor of 13. As a consequence, this is the scientific work which was done by Rockstrom. Uh, he, Rockstrom actually started in Sweden, the Resilience Institute, and they have identified nine planetary boundaries and identified also major challenges which we are focusing. In two areas, they have identified that we are already beyond zone of uncertainty, where the risk is very high. That is disappearing biodiversity. And the second is nutrients management, nitrogen, phosphorus. And in two areas, we are in the zone of uncertainty, increasing risk, climate change, and the land system change. If you think thoroughly, all those four areas are very closely connected to the food production. So the way how we will produce food in the future will be very much uh, decide, decisive for the sustainability. 
This is the report which was done very recently, signed by 15,000 scientists from 180 countries at the end of the previous year. It was the World Scientist Warning to Humanity, a second one. The first one was issued in 1992, when it was the first Earth Conference in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, the statement is very clear. Humanity has failed to make significant progress in generally solving these foreseen environmental challenges and alarmingly, most of them are getting worse. Basically, they are then pointing on the potentially catastrophic climate change and also on the mass extinction, so on the biodiversity loss. But let us now try to taste the 21st century, the things which we understand but not understand very well. We all got used to the figure that we will be 9.7 billion in 2050. This is official UN estimate. What does that mean? It means that in one year you will have on the planet additional Germany. In four years you will have additional United States of America. In nine days and six hours you will have Slovenia. So that's how it goes. But all that is actually happening in the least developed part of the world which means in the countries where people aspire to grow faster and they have all the right to catch up with us. So the pressure which will come in next decades on the resource use will be enormous. Second, when you look to the poverty and social inequality, eight people own the same as the poorest half of the world. And the richest 1% is more wealthy than the rest of the world. Nearly 800 million people are hungry. Over 2 billion suffer from micronutrient deficiencies, while over 2 billion people are obese. We throw away one third of the food we produce. If we go to environment, there is an increasing evidence of the climate change threat. 60% of ecosystems are today already degraded or used unsustainably. Disappearing biodiversity, the rate of number of species that become extinct, it's 1,000 to 10,000 times higher due to the presence of humans. More than 80% of the world's fisheries are at or beyond their biological limits. One third of soils, it's moderately to highly degraded due to various reasons. Half a million people die in Europe prematurely due to air pollution, which is approximately 15 times more than in car accidents. A million of plastic bottles are bought every minute globally. And we are, by the way, recycling less than 10% of plastic globally. Urbanization. Globally, an area of the size of United Kingdom has been converted to buildings since 1990. More than half of the cities which will exist in 2050 have not yet been started built. And finally, in the three years period 2011-13, China has used more cement than United States of America during the entire 20th century. Robotization, nearly half of the work we do, will be able to be automated by the year 2055. I think this is the most important fact which you should understand and not forget. For the first time in the human history, we live in a human socio-ecological system of planetary scope. So we are more interconnected and more interdependent than ever, which means that our individual and collective responsibility for future has increased enormously. I like this quote from the synchronous failure, the emerging casual architecture of global crisis, quite a lot. In a world where external reserves of resources are limited and second chances are thus increasingly rare, humankind must develop the ability to proactively navigate away from this new kind of crisis, globally extensive and intersystemic, that could otherwise irreversibly degrade the biophysical and economic basis for human prosperity. Okay, this picture is not too optimistic, but we have 
already given a clear signal that we do understand that the challenges which are ahead of us are quite enormous. The response was the Global Goals for Sustainable Development. One thing on which I would like to draw your attention is the fact that, of course, the trade-offs among those goals, SDGs, are unavoidable, they are existing, but according to our research in IRP, sustainable consumption and production is the most efficient strategy to mitigate them and create synergies among them. What does that mean? It means that concentrating on the responsible consumption and production and changing the economic model is essential if we are serious in delivering no poverty, zero hunger, if we want to have life below water in a sustainable way, climate action under control and so on. Everything at the, at the bottom line ends with human activity and human activity it's called economy. But let us look now to the economic model. This will be maybe not for the best for the scientists, uh, but it's so simplified that practically everybody should understand what is going wrong. This is the development trajectory of uh, where we are going. Here you have human development index. So more developed you are, more right you are. Here you have ecological footprint, so higher is your footprint, higher you are. The dots are the countries of the world, and the dots surrounded red are European Union member states. So we are all living well, and our environmental footprint is, of course, too high. The green corner here contains all the countries in the world where people are living well within the planetary boundaries, zero. So the problem is that in the development path, we all start going up, and when we face the problems, then we start going down. The real responsibility for the future development of the world lies in developing countries, because we need to show that we are ready and able to go down. We are those who master knowledge, innovation, technology still, and it's essential that we share it with those countries which are now on the development path, if they want to really leapfrog and do not repeat the mistakes which we have done in the past. If you look to the economic models in which we are living, the price signals which we are sending on the markets, financial capital overvalued, human capital undervalued, and natural capital to a large extent not valued at all. We are living in the market economies where us producers and consumers are supposed to act rationally, and then we are surprised that we, we are living in economic model which is in economic, social, and environmental imbalance. So it's simply the state of the signals which we are sending. It's actually the recognition of that, that the markets are working. In the midterm, according to the analysis of IRP, except in specific cases, resource shortage will not be the core limiting factor of our economic development. But the environmental and health consequences caused by this excessive and irresponsible use of resources will be or to tell you in a different way. You might remember that Chinese government closed some year or years ago, in a day, 2,000 factories around Beijing. They did not close them because they were short of steel or cement or whatever. They closed them because their influence on the air in Beijing was critical. And this is what is causing the real changes and the real need for, for uh, quicker changes. I was fighting when I was environment commissioner constantly that we would have economic, social, and environmental equal pillars. But if I'm frank, even that is wrong. The thing would more or less need to look like that. So ecosystems and inside ecosystems, socio-technical systems providing social needs and value because we simply need to respect the home which is hosting us. This is the same story only that it's a bit more complex, it's showing you everything. It was produced by European Environmental Agency. And the major problem of all system is actually in environmental externalities. Because uh, natural resources are simply not valued. Environmental externalities are the costs which are already existing, but we deny them. They are not paid by the producer and consumer of the good they are paid either 
through your health and health system, or which is the most uh, common by the next generations because they cannot complain. And uh, it's actually, in a way, we are indebting them. While we have clear rules in budgetary indebtedness that we should not indebt future generations, we have no such rules in the environment. On the contrary, in many cases, we are even stimulating that. This is a good example exactly of that. These are the figures from Green Growth Indicators 2017. The most developed world countries, OECD countries, have in the years 2000 till 2014 increased the fossil fuel subsidies more than it was the increase of the GDP, while they are all talking about addressing the climate change. The problem, in essence, in the system is that profits are privatized and costs are, in many cases, socialized. So if you look to the measures of the societal development that include natural capital also depletion, if I go from something which is used in our policy making, GDP, and then go to the measures which include also social and natural, human development index, genuine progress indicator, inclusive wealth index. More do you include social and natural, less is the growth. Actually, in the last two, you come to the negative growth, which is leading to the conclusion that a lot of the growth in the past was actually bad growth, not good growth. Any growth which created higher costs, even in, if they were paid by the future generations, it's not a good growth. And politics is too much concentrated on the growth rates anyway, because we, in essence, live from the level of the GDP which we have created. We don't go into the shop and say, I'm growing 5%, can I get that and that? It depends on how much of the wealth you have created uh, in the past. We are too much concentrating on flows anyway, not enough on stocks, and I have already mentioned that the debt is also one of the problems. Just that you would get the right impression, if one country it's growing 10%, everything, all production and consumption doubles in seven years. If a country is growing 7%, everything doubles in 10 years, and China today is growing 7%. Everything doubles in 10 years. What does that mean for the business sector and the business responsibility? The change there is happening quite fast. This is a quote from New York Times from 1970, where Milton Friedman was, was bluntly saying, what does it mean to say business has responsibilities? Only people can have responsibilities. This changed a lot. This is the quote from Eldie Fink, who is a BlackRock founder and chief executive. This is the major investment fund globally. And he, he said in the interview for Financial Times this year, Society is demanding that companies, both public and private, serve a social purpose. To prosper over time, every company must not only deliver financial performance, but also show how it makes positive contribution to society. So from being pure product or service providers and managing the risks of the company itself through the profit maximization, this company should become socially responsible managing also the risks of the societies. It's not helping if you are walking faster, if you are walking in the wrong direction. And that's why we have to change some of the things. So now I'm, now I'm going to the next part, which is connected to resource management. And I will only briefly touch some of the basic uh, thoughts which were developed by the International Resource Panel. This is a kind of logic which we tried to follow. We believe that human well-being can and must develop faster than the economic activity, and that economic activity should not depend on the amount of the resources used. It should be decoupled. If you want to grow, you have to grow with the same or less amount of the resources. And both 
the economic activity and resource use needs to be decoupled from environmental impacts. We have a really good base of material flows and resource productivity. Actually, now it's 1970, 2017 already. But some of the conclusions which follow from that database are these. Consumption has been, in last decades, stronger driver of growth in material use than population growth. The richest countries consume, on average, 10 times more materials as the poorest countries. Since the year 2000, material efficiency, that's the use of materials per capita, uh, per the unit of GDP, has actually declined, which, means, which is a really surprising fact, because, uh, because the, all the countries are more efficient in using the resources, <coughs> but what we are facing is a shift of the structural production from resource-efficient countries like Europe, Japan, to resource inefficient countries like China, India. So they are doing more products. And while we are all going up with the resource productivity, all our uh, summary is going still a bit down. The level of well being achieved in wealthy industrial countries simply cannot be generalized globally based on the same system of production and consumption. From the other report which we have produced for G7, where we were addressing the issue of the resource efficiency, conclusions are this. With concerted action, there is significant potential for increasing resource efficiency. Markets will not achieve higher rates of resource efficiency by themselves. Public policy and political will be needed. There are significant barriers to the increases in resource efficiency required, but they can be removed. And improving resource efficiency, it's indispensable for meeting climate change targets cost effectively. The whole climate policy is actually, face, uh, it's actually focusing on, climate, on carbon management and greenhouse gases. And they are not focusing on the land management, water management, and materials management, and on the decoupling story. So we have a major opportunity if we do not look only from the supply side of energy, but also from the demand side, uh, from the consumption side, that we address uh, climate change more effectively than we are currently addressing. One of the reasons why resource efficiency is not by itself developing faster, it's of course lying in the fact that natural resources are simply not valued. We have found through the research that there is a high disconnect between the resource efficiency and economic efficiency. So not everything which is resource efficient, it's also economically efficient. And that's why we believe that pricing externalities, using taxation, other incentives to factor, to favor, uh, for actors to favor paying for labor to save materials rather than materials to save labor would be much better policy that we would need to pursue. Okay, <clears throat> we are now at circular economy. Many are wondering what does that mean? This is a butterfly which was created by Ellen MacArthur Foundation. On the left hand side, you have the management of uh, biotic resources, so the things which could be, which are renewable. And on the re right hand side, you have technical materials, abiotic resources. Some are connecting circular economy with recycling. To be precise, recycling is the worst of the circular economy. It's good, but it's the worst. Because much better it's to maintain, prolong, share, reuse, redistribute, refurbish, remanufacture, everything which prolongs the life of the products, services, materials. In one sentence, circular economy is a system in which you try to keep various kinds of resources as long as possible in the production and consumption system and maintain the value of those resources as high as possible. Three examples. Remanufacturing. Remanufacturing is a comprehensive and rigorous industrial process by which a previously sold, worn, non-functional product or component is returned to like new 
or better than new condition. The case study of cylinder head, if you produce it or remanufacture it, you can cut uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 50%, water used by 90, energy used by 80, material use, of course, you don't practically need it, and landfill, you don't need it because it's not landfilled. It. The second example of mobile phone. You can produce a gold wedding ring by extracting 10 tons of gold ore or by recycling 10 kilos of mobile phone. Still, less than 10% of mobile phones are today recycled, and approximately 100 million are staying in the drawers of European citizens. If you don't believe me, then ask yourself the question, how many are in my drawer? This would mean 2.4 tons of gold, 25 tons of silver, 1 ton of palladium, 900 tons of copper, and I could continue. And the, this, is, uh, uh, this was just recently published by JRC, Joint Research Center. It's actually telling how many of the elements in the periodic system are recycled. More than 50% it's blue. Less than 1% it's red. And then you have everything between, just to get the glimpse where we stand with real recycling rates. The third example, probably the best, it's the mobility system. We all see how quickly the things are today moving. The fossil combustion engine is extremely inefficient. Approximately 1% of the energy which we put in the tank, it's used to move people down the road. Even if we change that, even with the introduction of electric vehicles and so on, of course we are not changing the fact that typically European car today it's parked 92%. One point, one percent is sitting in congestion. 1.6 it's looking for the parking space, which means that 5% we are driving. But even when we are driving, the average number of people in the car are 1.5, which means that the utility of the car is 2% today, 2%. Not to mention the death, injuries, and everything which is connected with that. You know what is happening today in mobility system. It's not, it is important to change the car, but even more it's important to change the mobility system. So to integrate the changed car and the new philosophy, self-driving, electric cars, into the overall different kind of mobility system sharing in particular. And I'm pretty sure that in the cities, in, in bigger cities in 20, 30 years, there will be no more privately owned cars because it makes no sense. This is a, an example of the business kind of menu for better economy of all the possible measures which you can use when you go to the circular economy from regenerate, share, optimize, loop, virtualize, exchange. Companies which are already doing that, a lot of companies are already doing that. The real problem is how to mainstream that through the whole economy. Some recent trends related to the circular economy which are worth exploiting and mentioning to you. The first circularity gap report was issued just less than a month ago. Our world economy is only 9.1% circular, leaving a massive circularity gap. One thing on which we have to pay the attention is that we put the humans and the social aspects of the circular economy pretty much in the center. If we want model to be global, we should do everything that in the developing part of the world it will not be seen as a kind of new experiment from the western part of the world which we have done to protect our competitiveness. And that's why it is important that we look through it how it's connected to local jobs, how it's connected to social effects and everything. So that's one angle which we have to take into account. The second is the bioeconomy which is also a trend which is very quickly developing now. The bioeconomy is actually connected to this part, so to biotic resources. And the real question of the bioeconomy is how much of the products which are currently produced in this technical, in abiotic world, we can transfer into biotic world. But bioeconomy can be as damaging 
as the classical economy if it's not following the principles of circularity and sustainability. Then cities and the circular economy, it's an important trend which we also have to look at. Why? Because all the governance and major changes can be done through the cities, sharing models, mobility systems, waste recycling, sustainable buildings, energy efficiency, and I can continue. Then connecting it to the climate change, I have already mentioned how we could profit from that. And this is in particular important, that's retaining value in the economic system. I will show you one example, it was just recently published a few days ago. It's retaining value in the Swedish material system, the case of plastics. Official figures of the Swedish recycling are showing that Sweden is recycling 53% of plastic. But let us look to the figure. Value, end of use plastic each year is 10 billion krons. 80% of that is incinerated and you get for, out of that only 0.4 billion krons. That's the energy value. 16% it's new plastic, but even there you have some degraded plastic, quality is degrading. And 4% it's landfilled, which is of course zero. All in all, from 10 billion you get one three billion, which means that in value retention, it's actually recycling 13%. In materials, it's 53%. So you can see from this picture clearly in what phase this is actually happening. I will not go more into detail, just that you would know that all those things are studied clearly. Policy options for circular economy are from global, European, national, local, regional, of course, through regulation. Majority of that is on the EU level because uh, knowing or not, majority, more than 80% of all the laws in your country are actually emerging on the EU level. So environment is really rich concerning that. Then there are market measures, fixing costs and prices, taxes, subsidies, public procurement, removing market and trade barriers, then other supportive initiatives, cooperation platforms, facilitation activities, eco-industrial parks, secondary markets, no business, new business models, knowledge sharing, guidance, coaching. There is practically no recipe and each one has to use in his own environment things which are working best. Finally, about the leadership and governance. Why about the leadership and governance? Because I firmly believe that without the leadership and governance, this will not happen. Few quotes which I think are the best explaining where we are standing today. From the dawn of the system leadership, we face a host of systemic challenges beyond the reach of existing institutions and their hierarchical authority structures. Problems like climate change, destruction of ecosystems, growing scarcity of water, youth unemployment, embedded poverty and inequity require unprecedented collaboration among different organizations, sectors, even countries. We are at the beginning of the beginning how to catalyze and guide system change at a scale commensurate with the scale of the problems we face and we all see but dimly. The second one from uh, Harari, the fact that Western elites are waking from their dream of the end of the history may actually increase our chances confronting global problems successfully. Part of that dream was the notion that these elites know best what is good for the humanity. The coming years might well be characterized by intense soul searching and by attempts to formulate new social and political visions. This is from Stephen Hawking. It was a kind of response to the, to the elections in, in, in United States and to the Brexit story. This was a cry of anger of people who felt they have been abandoned by their leaders. What matters now, far more than the choices made by those two electorates, is how the elites react. Should we in turn reject those votes as outpourings of crude, po crude populism that fail to take account of the fact and attempt to circumvent and circumscribe the choices that they represent, this would be a terrible mistake. He claims the concerns underlining these votes about the economic consequences of globalization and accelerating technological change are absolutely understandable. We are living in a world of widening, not diminishing financial inequality in which many people can see not just their 
standard of living, but their ability to earn of a living at all disappearing. So free capabilities which are connected to the system leaders and they have developed and nurtured at this, helping people see the larger system and build a shared understanding of complex problems, fostering reflection and more generative conversations, and finally shifting the collective focus from reactive problem solving to co-creating the future. On the governance, it is absolutely clear that many of those questions cannot be addressed in a different way than by us together. And if we have any model of governance today globally which really proved to work, it's European Union. Because 70 years ago, from a very simple reason, that is to avoid the conflicts and wars, we decided that we will cooperate. I think that we are globally today pretty much in the same position which, in which it was Europe after the Second World War. If we don't more cooperate on solving the issues which I have represented to you, we will face more conflicts and wars. I think it's unavoidable. And Europe, it's an ideal position to lead because we have a lot of good and bad experiences which we have learned from the governance on the European level. By the way, this is a quote from this year's World Economic Forum annual meeting. The challenge seems to not be one of not inadequate scientific evidence anymore, rather it's the one of cooperation and implementation. There is a deepening perception of a lack of synchronity between economic and environmental policy responses to global risks. So I was thinking one of the possibilities, you know that we have from 1992 three Rio conventions, two are more vocal, one is on climate change, the other on biodiversity, CBD, and the third one on combating deforestation is less vocal. But there is no efficient instrument which would bring people around the global table to address major conditions needed to change the economic model. There might be a need for a kind of natural resource management convention which would connect existing conventions to resource management, to the necessary system change of existing economic model and enable the removal of existing market and trade barriers. It could actually serve as a kind of education tool for the developing nations that they could use. To conclude, you can call it whatever you wish. Sustainable economy, low carbon economy, circular economy, green economy, resource efficient economy, energy efficient economy, decoupling, free arts, which is actually the Japanese approach, ecological civilization, which is uh, uh, Chinese approach, cradle to cradle, bioeconomy, ecoeconomy, blue economy. By the way, all these are phrases which we have used in policy making. What we actually talk about is that new economic model based on sustainable consumption production, integrating all pillars of sustainability, it's necessary and unavoidable. That we simply have to fix a broken compass. Main points which I would like you to remember from this lesson, for the first time in human history, we face emergence of a single, tightly coupled human socio-ecological system of planetary scope. It is about system change. Without leadership and improved global governance, SDGs are only wishful thinking. Transition to a new economic model, integrating all pillars of sustainability should be in the center of our attention. Trade-offs among various SDGs are unavoidable. Sustainable consumption production is the most efficient strategy to mitigate them and create synergies and circular economy it's a very good concept instrument to operationalize that in practice. Implementing SDGs should be priority of any government defined in the strategic documents, supported by indicators, monitoring, reporting, and linked to the core economic policy decisions. All economic policies should be systematically adjusted. Synergies among various policy approaches to climate change, biodiversity loss, resource management should be exploited. All levels, global, European, national, local, 
and all stakeholders from public and private actors, financial sector, civil society, academia, should actively participate in the system change. Active dialogue with potential losers, it's necessary to make the transition fair and possible. We should focus our efforts not only on the state and impact, air pollution, climate change, biodiversity loss, but also on the pressures and drivers leading to them, economic and social environmental imbalances. Change will not appear by waiting for the leadership of others. Be the leaders on your level of governance and authority in politics, in business, in making your investment decisions. If we are to avoid globally extensive and intersystemic crises and frequent conflicts, then let's get serious about implementing what we have agreed in SDGs. Changes are unavoidable and humans are supposed to be intelligent. So it's high time to prove it. Some are saying that this is a story of gloom and doom. In fact, any global transition, it's a major opportunity for new innovation, for new development, and for new jobs. And the real alternative, I would rather not talk about because it's the story of gloom and doom. I will end with three quotes from somebody you all know, from Albert Einstein, and they are very nicely matching to the things which I was trying to explain to you. The first one is, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we have created them. The second is, insanity is doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. And the third, when he was asked why it is that mankind has stretched so far as to discover the structure of the atom, but we have not been able to devise the political means to keep the atom from destroying us, he replied, this is simple, my friend, it's because politics is more difficult than physics. And this is pretty much the story of physics. But uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the solutions are in the hands, in many cases, of politics. Some are saying that this is the story of the future, but unfortunately, the future, it's called present. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Potocznik, for this very thoughtful and to some extent obligating lecture. Inevitably, there will be some questions. And maybe you will yeah. be willing to answer yeah, sure. one or two. Do I see any raised hands? Yes, please. Sir, Malas. Thank you very much for a very exciting talk. Uh, do you ever think that uh, uh, the Western world is uh, going to be there's a time to revisit what we call political ideologies at the same time and actually restate them because we've seen the growth of the world, the economic uh, growth of the last century to grow exponentially but yet we have really depleted or we are in the process of depleting our resources mm -hmm. uh, and is it therefore time to revisit uh, uh, what we call political ideologies to enrich them with elements of sustainable growth rather than just growth. Some of your statements are really political connotations. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> now we, you, you know that these initiatives are going on. One of uh, the most known was uh, Stiglitz Commission, which was uh, constituted on the initiative of President Sarkozy at that time. And actually they were working on beyond GDP. The problem is that GDP is simple, known, and everybody understands it, at least pretend to understand it. Because those figures, if go up, they think it's good. If they go down, they think it's bad. But GDP, if you go to the history of the GDP, it was uh, created in the US as a reaction uh, on 1928 crisis and we still have it 
uh, it would be essential that not only when you measure what is good for society, that you go broader, but that you also change the measurement in the companies themselves. Because if you don't do that, uh, you and everything in essence starts with the measurement. What you don't measure, you don't uh, respect and you don't take, in take into account in policy making. But we should not overestimate also as politicians because uh, uh, giving us too much of complicated facts, it's not something which we like. And that's why GDP is surviving and surviving. And uh, unfortunately, I, I basically believe that it's a useful indicator. I think it simply needs to be complemented with other things, which would give you also an impression uh, of what is the quality of life in your surroundings. For example, I, I believe that Slovenia is excellent for living better than many countries on the West which have higher GDP, but uh, from reasons which are not measurable exactly in the figure of GDP. Thank you. Any others? Yes. Um, during our time in the Commission, we have adopted the uh, targets for a 2020 strategy. Yes. One of them was on energy. Mm -hmm. With your latest experience, do you think that, first of all, are we going to reach those targets? And if so, are they sufficient? Yeah. I think from those times we have moved a lot ahead uh, because uh, there was um, the latest was, of course, the Paris Agreement and the things which moved uh, uh, much further than actually. I think that in, the, in tackling the climate change, we are simply too slow and that we see that in a way how we are dealing with those questions will not really resolve them efficiently enough. And, uh, uh, but uh, some of the targets which we have adopted, if you remember the biofuels, by the way, I was against the 10% uh, because I've got at that time the study which, I've, which came from Joint Research Center and the study was basically saying that in 2020 you can reach biofuels only with the first generation which was substituting the food for energy and this is at least uh, immoral if nothing else. Uh, and uh, but so we have later on changed also that target but I think that uh, if we will not go more also in the area of which in the area which I try to explain uh, uh, to explain to the not only to the supply but for to the demand side if we don't go to that so you can produce energy in a more renewable way but the population will grow if you do not decrease the use of other resources and the use of any other resources is CO2 emission, then we will have a major problem. So with the reorganization of the economic system in the way I have explained, you have very successfully contributed to fighting the climate change. Only that we are working and we have worked also in the Commission in two silences. So there was energy climate and there was environment and the rest of the economy and uh, they did not talk and they still don't talk too efficiently among each other. So maybe we, we thank our speaker again for a most thoughtful and interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.